Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Mary Watson. I'm the executive dean of the New School for Public Engagement. And on behalf of the New School and um, all of our community, I welcome you here tonight to this uh, fantastic evening celebrating um, the film James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket. Um, what you're about to see is a really extraordinary piece of work. I know that the filmmakers um, and producers and others involved in the production of the film and the making of the film are going to be participating in a conversation panel after the, um, after the film is shown. But let me just start with just a few comments about what I know about this work. Um, this screening of James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket, is part of a year-long citywide celebration of the year of James Baldwin, presented in partnership with Harlem Stage, Columbia University School of Arts and New York Live Arts, and in collaboration with the Vera List Center for Art and Politics, the School of Media Studies, and the School of Writing at the New School. Um, those of you who know the New School know that we have been imagining and reinventing higher education for nearly 100 years, starting in 1919 with the ambitious and innovative um, group of rebels who came to found a new type of university, one that really brought together the creative arts um, with the intellectual rigor and the academic uh, sense of making scholarship that mattered on issues of activism and social justice. So, here now, almost 100 years later, we stand in this uh, relatively newly constructed grand new university center with a brilliant and fantastic screen featuring this magnificent film. But the values that we had at the beginning are in place today. And one of the ways those values play out are through these series of public programs that we run, like tonight, but also in the spectacular students who come to study here at the new school. Um, this event tonight is sponsored in part by the School of Media Studies, which has programs in media studies, in media management, and in documentary filmmaking, and hosts um, graduate students from 28 countries around the world. So we have a very global presence here, and a very creative uh, and imaginative group of students, filmmakers, media makers, and others, who are really committing their lives to work that will make a difference, like this work will tonight. So tonight's screening is the New York City premiere of the newly restored high definition version of the, that celebrates the 25th anniversary of the film's release. The digital support um, for restoration was made possible by the Ford Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Maisel's Documentary Center, and Stan and Joan Martyr. And so now let me introduce Michelle Mater, who will be the moderator of this evening's events. Michelle is assistant professor in the School of Media Studies, one of the four schools in the School for Public Engagement. Her professional background spans more than 25 years of experience as a film producer, a writer, a lecturer, an arts administrator, a film programmer, a media consultant, a Caribbean film scholar, and teacher. She asked me not to go on and on about how amazing she is. I hear her from the audience speaking. But I also want to say that um, she has um, curated and produced the Creatively Speaking film series now in its 18th year, which features work by and about women and people of color. Michelle Mater. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we are so thrilled to be able to bring you this amazing, amazing film that you're going to see tonight. Um, it is indeed um, something that you don't get to see very often. And the version that we're seeing tonight is the first time anyone in New York City is seeing it. So you're the first. And we have uh, this in large part due to a um, group of people here that uh, actually need no introductions, but um, we're gonna talk about who's here after the film. But I just wanna acknowledge uh, Karen Thornson and Douglas Dempsey, who are the co-producers. Stand up, you guys. Who, um, who are responsible for who are responsible for this, this great work we're about to see. Uh, Karen will be joining myself and Ricardo Montez, uh, my colleague here at the New School. Where are you, Ricardo? Oh, there he is, Heidi. Uh, for a conversation after the film, as well as you. You're going to be joining in the conversation, so don't think you're getting off the hook. All of my students who are here know that you got to participate, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, see, they're laughing. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time because we do want to have a conversation with you afterwards and with the filmmakers and some of the producers and other amazing um, people who are involved with the film that are here in the audience. So without further ado, um, we're thrilled to present The Price of the Ticket. Thank you.
An amazing piece of work, huh? Yes. An amazing filmmaker who made it happen. I am not alone. And yes, okay, so let's say that again. An amazing piece of work, yes. <laughs> um, I want to invite Ricardo Montez to come up, my, my co-moderator this evening. And Karen, uh, there's some people in the audience we want to first thank and uh, mention that we're here. Come. come. Oh my. It's a family. I think that Jimmy made everybody feel like a family. I'm gonna... Sorry. He still gets me. It's 25 years since we made this film. It was in 1986 that we started working with him and 1987 when he died, and this film was an extraordinary privilege, and there are so many people in this audience. I know everyone here is connected to Jimmy in some way, but there are actually filmmakers, team members, who were here, and I, I can't begin to thank you guys enough. And Albert Mazels is sitting right here, and it wouldn't have happened without him. He gave me... He gave a green light to a project on James Baldwin. He was going to make a film on Jimmy, a cinema verite, I should say direct cinema film about James Baldwin and the writing of his next book. And can I just tell this one story before we sit down? <laughs> it's just that Jimmy was going to write a book called Remember This House. He was going to go through the South, revisit the places where he had been during the Civil Rights Movement and where he had become friends with Medgar Evers and with Martin Luther King and eventually Malcolm X as well. He knew their children. He had literally bounced them on his knee. So what he wanted to do was write a book remembering the movement, remembering the places, but even more importantly, remembering the people. And so Albert and I, as producer, with Albert directing this film, and I know he doesn't believe he directs films, but <laughs> we'll say that. Um, he was going to film James Baldwin interviewing these kids, as well as going through the South. and he, he was going to ask a question while our cameras were rolling and the, the kids, the children, uh, the daughter of Malcolm X, the son of Medgar Evers, Martin Luther King, were going to be asked, was it worth it for your father to be assassinated? Well, it's like what you saw here, Jimmy's saying, how much time do you want for your progress? And that would have been an amazing film. We never got to make it. But when Jimmy died, well, we sat around and thought the project was over and then suddenly it wasn't and there's more to be said about that but thank you Albert thank you Albert and I think there's some members of the Baldwin family that are here with us can you see right here I, I would like you to know there are, there are Helen Brody here Baldwin, here Trevor. Trevor Baldwin Helen Brody Baldwin he's standing yes thank you so much for joining us <laughs> And we'll now take our seats. We're recording, so we definitely need to. We want to hear you. <laughs> take your microphone. Yes. So let's first introduce some of the members of the, of the crew that are here. So go ahead, Karen. Oh my goodness, first of all, there's, there's my co-producer and husband, Douglas Dempsey. Yes, where is Douglas? Douglas Dempsey, where are you, Douglas? Please stand. There he is, over here. <laughs> there he is. We weren't married at the time. <laughs> ah, so Jimmy brought you together, of course. It's one of those things. <laughs> Um, also, I, my gosh, I can't begin to say everybody who's here. I know Tim Housel, one of our cinematographers, is here. I know Peter Miller, our extraordinary sound man, is here. I don't know if other people are here because I can't see. But Anybody who's here who has, has anything to do with the film, could you stand for us, please, so we can see you? Please, please, Peter, stand. Yes, who's that over there? To your left. Can you see? Oh, Douglas is going to help us. And <laughs> and when, when we introduced the whole thing with the support of, and none of this would have happened at all without the incredible support of Goldcrest Post, by oh, the yes. way, yes. Uh, who made this whole restoration, and Tim Spitzer, the managing director, 
is here, and I know he doesn't want to stand up, but he's right there. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, perhaps more important, Tim was with us at the very beginning. I mean, he was involved in this film from way, this is a project, Jimmy does something to people. Mm -hmm. The archival material that is in here is because people were so inspired by him. Before we get to that, because we definitely want to speak on that, um, there was another producer who, uh, whose images you saw in the slides that Douglas put together that were playing when you came into the oh. theater. His name was Bill Miles. Yes. And we lost Bill Miles almost a year ago, this past May, right? He went in, he went in May, but he's with us here he's in spirit. Definitely. And Bill was a mentor of mine and to many filmmakers um, of, of color across this country, and I'm sure in this room. Um, for those of you who don't know, he was the considered one of the premier documentarians of African American life um, in this country. And his four-hour film, I Remember Harlem, people heard of that. Is Dick Adams here? I don't know Is if- Is Dick um, here? I, no. I'm not sure. His co-producer was, was going to be here as well, yes. So this film has so many, so much history to it, and it's such a document in so many ways, in addition to this amazing man's life. Um, but as you could see, Maya Angelou, Gordon Parks, Stokely Carmichael, I mean, the list goes on and on, who are none of whom are, are oh. with us anymore. This is like Amiri Baraka. I mean, it's been quite, quite something in terms of the losses that recently that we've had. And I would like to say something about doc Dr. Maya Angelou, if I may. She, um, first of all, she corrected me when I first interviewed her because I had the audacity to call her Maya. Uh -oh. <laughs> and she said, my dear, uh -oh. <laughs> I, I have been through so much and done so much to attain this title, I would appreciate it if you would call me Dr. Angelo. So I want to say that Dr. <laughs> Angelo, this past October, she died this yes. spring. Yeah. Um, this past October, she gave her, um, it was like a last act of love because she recorded a voiceover that will allow this film to become a 45 minute version of Jimmy. I know that's a sacrilege, but on the other hand, it will allow high school students and it's very People important. with a shorter attention span. <laughs> yes, very <laughs> to, important. To appreciate James Baldwin. And that was extraordinary. We went to her home. Yes. Before we go on to, um, I just do want to give Ricardo a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Ricardo Montes, who is an assistant professor of performance studies here at New, New School for Public Engagement, whose research focuses on race, sexuality, and visual culture. He served as a faculty fellow in Latino studies at NYU and was a cost and pro postdoctoral fellow in race and ethnicity studies at Princeton. His new book, Keith Haring's Line, Race and the Performance of Desire, explores the construction of race within American popular culture through an examination of the 1980s pop artist, Keith Haring, forthcoming. My colleague, Ricardo Montes. And Ricardo, since I've been talking so much, why don't you <laughs> ask Karen the first question? All right. Well, you know, it's just um, such an amazing opportunity, and to, to be able to, to kind of see um, Baldwin uh, speak the truth, um, and it's just it's it's quite moving. And I'm left with this um, statement at the end of, of digging through the runes and seeing kind of mm -hmm. what's what's left, um, and that leads me to, to to the question of the archive. Because I think, like, first of all, how do you begin this project, this kind of monumental project? Um, but I'm also interested in how access to archival materials, finding materials, getting them authorized for incorporation into something like this can tell another kind of political story. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. OK. Um, first of all, when Bill Miles and I began to Mike. imagine, Mike. when Bill Miles, sorry, when Bill Miles and I began to imagine with Albert what kind of a film this might be, we were afraid that it would be, well, he was important and he wrote great stuff and so there must be photographs of him hunched over a typewriter and maybe we could have some people read his work. So we didn't imagine all that it would become, but we had hope and we knew it was important and then we gradually hired 15 researchers in different countries because we discovered that James Baldwin had 
such an effect on people that they were inspired to go take a weekend off from their work, drive down from Germany or over from Switzerland or fly in from wherever and film him. And so there's all of this amazing verite footage and in honor of, of Albert, I like to think of it as, um, well, it's not exactly direct cinema or, or cinema verite because Jimmy's gone, but we call it cinema verite passe because <laughs> there is just so much of Jimmy alive. And the, then our question was, well, gee, not just having the rights to it was finding it, but then what would happen if you entered, what if, first of all, back in the day, there most documentaries had narration at the time, and we didn't want to do that. Being a, a Maisel's disciple, I didn't want to make a film with narration, but how would it work to cut images of Jimmy in, in his 30s and 40s with his 60s and go back and forth? And it turned out one of the things that impressed me so much about him as I got to know him was his consistency. He actually was able to say things <sighs> At, you know, 20 years apart and finish his own sentence because he still believed it, because it was at the core of him and, and what he believed. And that archive gathered over 100 archival sources, I think is the count, but there, it's all at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and it's, it's still being cataloged. It's, a, I think, a question of not just time, but finance. But um, we wanted it to be available to the public, and there's, there's an amazing amount. Um, Karen, one of the questions I have always wanted to ask about this film is that you made an interesting choice in terms of your story arc by starting with the funeral. And, you know, especially telling a biographical film, people feel like you have to do the chronological thing. What was your choice uh, in, in start, choosing to start with the, with the funeral? Thank you for asking it. <laughs> it was almost... It wrote itself. I, I truly feel that I am a conduit for something far more powerful because when we were first working with Jimmy on the Remember This House effort, um, I called him on his birthday in the summer before he died and then spoke to him again in September and we had heard via the grapevine that he wasn't well. And so I was checking in because we had, we had raised money and we had a plan and was he okay? And the last conversation I had with him, he said, well, um, don't worry, Karen, we'll be filming by the end of the year. Well, he died on December 1st and we were filming but before the end of the year. And a small story, when we were, um, where we worked at Maisel's Films, we had these little cubicles where we kept our, our received our mail. And after that morning when I heard from a friend from Maisel's who called me at 7.30 in the morning saying, I just heard on NPR James Baldwin died last night. And so suddenly this project that was so important was suddenly dissolving before our eyes and we all shed tears. And then I went over to my mail about an hour into the day and there in the box was a letter from James Baldwin. And David Leeming, the biographer, wonderful friend who was here, had to leave to catch his train, but David has told me how Jimmy dictated this letter and David typed it, but then the letter at the bottom, in kind of shaky handwriting, the period was crossed out, and it's, oh, I guess I should say, first he said, Dear Karen, I, I'm sorry to say that for reasons of health, I won't be able to participate in the film project as planned. Then the period, then a cross out, and then in this handwriting, for the time being. So all of a sudden, it seemed as if there was going to be a project. I mean, how can you turn down an invitation like that? And so I truly believe that everything that came flying in the window from everywhere, were, there was a master plan. And what we've done with this restoration, and thank you, Tim Spitzer and Goldcrest Post, because I personally, I thought it looked great. It does, it looks amazing. It looks amazing. It's, it's just that we're, in, a, in our own small way, bringing Jimmy into the 21st century where he is so incredibly, painfully relevant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> quickly, just to answer your question about the funeral, at the time when you were planning the film with Albert, Baldwin was still in that period of, oh, he's bitter, et cetera. And there was a feeling that you know, we have to kind of reestablish how monstrous 
this reputation is. And one of the things about that funeral, you saw the big gold doors open. Apparently, they hadn't done that at St. John the Divine, where the funeral was, uh, since uh, Duke Ellington. And it, it was just such an immense ceremony that you felt, if you start with this, and you have Dr. Angelo and Amiri Baraka, you can see him spitting as he says, God's black revolutionary. Yeah. OK, you get the idea, and you're going to watch what follows. Right. So there's no slow ramping up. Mm -hmm. Bang, Here's, here he is. Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely the feeling that you get from, from that. Um, and just what you were just sort of pick up on what you just said about Jimmy being so relevant to today. I mean, so many of the things in the audience I know felt that I heard, I heard us all respond. Um, you know, his, his words, his thoughts, his actions were so ahead of his time. I mean, he, it was as though he were predicting the future in so many ways. And when you're watching this today, I just want to keep playing over and over and over again some of the things that he's saying in this film. Ricardo. Well, I think Karen said to, that I, to make sure that I mentioned that I, I teach another country today and in what context I teach it in. And it's, you know, it's, I, I do all this work around cross racial desire and trying to think through what that is. And this novel, when I teach it in the context of queer New York, does this amazing work of introducing and feeling through cross-racial desire and the violence of cross-racial desire, and it's so dynamic, and students always mention, like, it's so resonant with their experiences and their understanding of what's going on today. That, that book blew me away, I, and it still does so. I, I talk to people now, 2014, who have just read it for the first time. And Giovanni's room. Which, which book? Or another, or another country, country I'm speaking of right now, but all of the above. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he left us trying to catch up to him. I, one of the things that he said in the film, says in the film that still rocks me, but at the time it was the first time it had even occurred to me, is the sentence, well, as long as you insist on thinking you're white, I'm going to have to <laughs> think I'm black. Well, that hadn't occurred to me. And um, there are so many things that he gave me to move forward in my own life. And I think he still is rocking people. And certainly, given what's been going on in, in this country just in the last few months, of, uh, he's, he's more than relevant. He's very necessary. Very necessary, absolutely. Um, Another one of the points I wanted to make, and then we do want to open up to the, to the audience. We have a microphone here and here. So why don't you come on down and start lining up. Um, the fact that you were able to get the HD version of the film finished. What does that mean? Monday? You know, just everybody knows distribution is, is my thing. And, and so for, for me, what does that mean to you as the filmmaker, you and Doug? as the filmmakers to, to be able to have this? It, it means that we can help keep Jimmy alive and give people the gift of discovering this person. Some people growing up haven't even heard of him. He needs to be in the curriculum. He needs to be treasured and explored. And, and we need reminding of the things that he has to say. It also means that we're going to get to um, continue. You can draw attention to something because there's a, a certain value to having restore to film, first of all, the importance of saving it, but also saying, hey, you know, instead of being shaped like four by three and an old television screen, it's actually in a, a 16 by nine, a, a letterbox shape, and, and they look, you know, the images, that was 16 millimeter. We were able, this actually, it was thanks to Martin Scorsese that we went back to this restoration because he was making a documentary on um, Fran Leibowitz called Public Speaking, and uh, was on HBO, I think. And um, he, one of her earliest mentors and inspirations was James, Bald James Baldwin and, and Scorsese, who, who liked this documentary and is a longtime associate of Albert Maisel's. Is, um, he said, when we offered him, he wanted to use an excerpt, excerpt of the film in public speaking. And we offered him a video master. And he said, oh, no, no, I know you shot this on 16 millimeter. I want to go back to the original. So we get it up out of the, the lab. And it turns out that the film is actually, the interpositive is damaged, and there's you know, issues that we had to correct now, or it wouldn't happen. 
And so thanks to the Ford Foundation and, and PBS and Maisel's Documentary Center and, and close friends of ours, Joanne and Stan Martyr, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, they all helped kick in to make this restoration possible, and Goldcrest Post was absolutely wonderful in what they did. Making that happen means that we can go out there, say, hey, we've got something new, pay attention, but more to the point, we can do what we've got as our outreach plan is something called Conversations with Jimmy. We're going to go in various communities, and this will begin starting in Massachusetts with six different communities across the state because Jimmy taught in the five college area, so Massachusetts was a logical place to begin, but we're going to get people of differing ages and, and differing interests to come together, everyone from law enforcement officers to senior citizens to high school students to talk in community forums after seeing the film about their own local issues. So that's our plan. That's fantastic. That's amazing, and um, it'll be available through California Newsreel as well. The nonprofit distributor, educational distributor, and I must say American Masters, who was behind the film oh, in the yes. very beginning, it will be on PBS sometimes this coming year, Excellent. and probably after Jimmy's actual 90th birthday, which will be August 2nd of 2015. I, I know that there may be people who have questions. I wanted yes. to ask Trevor Baldwin very quickly Trevor. to tell us about the street naming, if he would. Could you oh, do that, please. Trevor? Yes, that should be on. Can the mic over here? Yes. Uh, hello, hey, everybody. Trevor. Hello, hello. Thank you for <laughs> Thank you. inviting me, and my mother's here. Uh, on behalf of the family, definitely thank you uh, because, you know, Uncle Jimmy said we need witnesses and you are the witnesses and purveyors of his legacy. I just happen to be blood. Um, the great thing that Karen just mentioned was that we got to name 128th Street between 5th and Madison, which we're James Baldwin's place. Uh, you, saw, you saw in the beginning of the film how important, and you saw my Uncle David singing the, the school song that Uncle Jimmy wrote, so it was only right that it, it took place there. I always want to give credit to Herb Boyd, who's not here, because he was one of the people who uh, um, selected that street, and I just sort of picked up the baton, and so... Um, Wouldn't have happened without you. Right, right, <laughs> indeed. So, But it's, all, it's, it's very fitting that this is a celebration in conjunction with the many institutions to celebrate his 90th year and reintroduce his relevance as we spoke about to all the social injustices that are going on today that you know we don't want to feel bitter about you know and and that we want to be frustrated and angry about because we have the right to um, and I think this film um, especially you can hear in my voice obviously it, it brings puddles to my eyes but I think everybody it shows all of our humanity. And I think that's always where I want to always uh, emphasize and a point I, I think he does so good to make us all self-reflect on. So thank you all. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. Does your mom want to say anything? <laughs> Hell. Okay. This is, this is a little fun fact as a... Uh, um, he was talking about uh, uh, being with Martin the last time at Carnegie Hall. I just learned um, today when you look at the picture of him and Martin, uh, you're going to see my mom like photobombed in the back. <laughs> and and it's, 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 uh, it's a little blurry, but I just, you know, it took me like 40 years to find that out. <laughs> and so I, I think that these ongoing celebrations are happening. Mom, can you just stand up and just sort of bow as the pioneer of photobomb history? Yes, please. For, for, uh, Thank you, Helen Brody Baldwin. I'll, I'll have to explain to her what photobombing is as well, but she's right in the center of it. And so... <laughs> I can't begin to thank Karen and all of you here who have been involved in this production, and all of us, because it is our lives. And if there's nothing else that this says, and I was really struck by the young children who came to an earlier um, done 
uh, uh, earlier um, conference yet yeah, this spring, who said, everything that we see and read about James Baldwin is relevant to our lives today. And it's wonderful that you, Karen, are going to take it out into the streets so that his name will be in the streets. And we know we come up from the streets marching that parade that is James Baldwin and the legacy of love. Come, come, come to the light, come to the light. Just stay right there. Speaking of photo bombs, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't in this, but Trevor was head chorister at the funeral. He was head chorister at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. I'd like to add about St. John the Divine that this, as David Leeming would have told us if he were still here, this was a place where Jimmy Baldwin was the first one to utter a swear word, I won't say which one, in the, in the pulpit while speaking. <laughs> I have heard that story. I wasn't there, but I And I think that probably was fairly radical that Mary Baraka was saying, if there is a God is in the pulpit. <laughs> and leave it to another uh, very revolutionary uh, poet and amazing author to say something like that, right? Could I ask... Ricardo, a question? Sure. <laughs> when, I know you're teaching in another country, but how did you first discover James Baldwin? When did he come into your life? Uh, su surprisingly recently, I sort of, um, he had been discussed, people were like, you're writing a book about these, these issues, you have to approach his literature, and it wasn't until I had the opportunity of teaching something like Queer New York, where I could incorporate this book, and when I did, it just sort of opened up this whole world. It was really quite a, um, important to me personally, I think to all of us, to broach the question, address the question of Jimmy's homosexuality because a film had been made on Langston Hughes not long before that and there was no mention whatsoever mm -hmm. of that side of his, shall we say, person, mm -hmm. persona. Um, I just, I feel so proud when Jimmy himself says we have to say yes to life and, we ha and to say, you know, you didn't tell me, I told you. That's right, I love that. <laughs> I love that line. You, know, you, couldn't, you couldn't blackmail me, right? <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Yes, hi. Hi, um, this is not a question. I'll just tell you about meeting Jimmy. Um, my name is Andy Velez, and uh, I was seeing his play uh, uh, at the then Anta Theater, which is now August Wilson Theater. And uh, I was with a friend, and at intermission I went up to him. The thing that, I had, intru that had introduced me to him was Giovanni's room. I was going to City College at night then, and I was about 20 years old. And it was such a breath of wonderful fresh air to read something about homosexual. <laughs> and uh, it was just great. So I said something to him about it, and he grabbed a hold of me and kissed me. And, and uh, I'm a founding member of Backed Up New York. I think he'd appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to draw a parallel. I'm not sure if it's appropriate, but there was something as, as surprising, as refreshing, as racy, as shocking, as finding out about Jimmy's homosexuality as it was for me to talk about you know, whites and blacks and the, and the kind of relations, including sexual relations, that they could have. This was as taboo yes. at the time. I, you know, I grew up coming out of that, and so it was definitely refreshing. I'm, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, good evening. Good um, evening. This is not uh, a question either, but I just want to thank you all for this event because I've read <laughs> Mr. Baldwin's books many, many, many years ago. 
And I'm gonna tell you, I've forgotten most of, this just refreshed my memory of the, all the books, because I read every last one, Go Tell on the Mountain Fire Next Time, um, Giovanni's Room, and Blues for Mr. Charlie really stood out in my mind. When, when I saw the play here, I recognized all the characters. Those, most of those people have passed away. Great actors. Oh. So I just wanna thank you guys for that. That was so wonderful. It's, it's so true. beautiful. And also, uh, I do have a question for you. Um, when you mentioned distribution, how and when is this going to be distributed? Karen. It will be it will be aired on PBS sometime after Jimmy's 90th birthday next year. Okay. It began with PBS. It was actually on PBS four days after it was finished. And of course, it, here it is today, about three days after it was finished. So I guess we're keeping <laughs> keeping the rhythm. Um, it, it's also available through California Newsreel, a nonprofit educational distributor, and we're going to be putting it out there in terms of, of taking it to towns and having community, community screenings. And I, you know, if somebody wants to host a conversation with Jimmy, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Have a good thank day. Thank you, thank you for your comment. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? My name is Mai, thank you so much for this wonderful film. Greetings to the Baldwin family. <laughs> I was uptown at the naming, street naming. So I have a question. Um, it's a Wikipedia question, if you will. And I realize that we at the university, we don't use Wikipedia <laughs> as like a, a source and everything. But it's just really interesting because for years, I've noticed that under schooling, it says that after high school, Baldwin studied at the new school where he found an intellectual community that he can identify with. And so I'm just really confused because there's, I've never seen, and I actually have conversations with my friend, we're like, he didn't go to the new school. Did he teach at the new school? Did he do a workshop? Like, what, what was it? So can you lead He any, did a workshop here. He, he did, taught or he studied? He led a workshop here. He okay, yes. so I can go on to Wikipedia and yes. change this. Yes, you said that. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> yes, because we actually, Alexandra and I, we, we researched this before we did the radio show um, with Aisha. With Aisha Baldwin. Yes. We I did, mean, Karifa Smart. Karifa Smart, yes. Uh, we did a radio show with um, Aisha Baldwin, Karifa Smart. And um, we did make sure that he had not attended here, but he did. Um, a, he was the, the guest speaker, I guess, the keynote for a workshop here in, did we remember the year? Do you remember? No, I don't remember. I don't remember but the I remember. year. This is my research assistant. That's why I'm <laughs> looking at her. <laughs> Go ahead, Alexia. Um, on that note, I just want to say that, um, well, first of all, thank you. And the first time I came in contact with James Baldwin was actually in Ricardo's class when we read uh, Another Country. And I'm a literature major here at the New School, and never have I read James Baldwin, the literature at Lang. And this really upset me that I had to go to public engagement to read James Baldwin in a queer New York class. And it was, I mean, it was great. But just on the topic of how James Baldwin has influenced and this film is about creating change, I hope that at the New School, when you're teaching a major American course, that you teach James Baldwin. And that's why she's my research assistant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hi. Again, thank you so very much. I, I don't have a question, but uh, just the symmetry that I noticed. At St. John's, at the funeral, the drummer was um, Ola Tunji. Ola Tunji, that's now, right. Now, Ola Tunji's album was phenomenal when it first came out, uh, Drums of Passion. Mm -hmm. But he came to Frederick Douglass Junior High School six months before the album came out and performed. Oh, oh, and so James Baldwin went to oh. Frederick Douglass Jr. High School, as did I. Oh. And I was in the auditorium when uh, John W. Desane brought in Michael Babatunde Olatunji, oh, who God. played uh, Shango and had us repeating, and um, Boba Nia Farasamdi Day. Everybody loves Saturday night. So just to see Olatunji and Baldwin going to Douglas and Ola Tunji first appearing in Douglas, and that just adds another flavor to the internationalism mm -hmm. and the respect that the school always spoke in terms of respect of uh, James Baldwin. So I just wanted to uh, put that wow. out there. Oh, thank, thank you, you for that. that. Yes. How extraordinary. I never, I had no clue, and 
And for us, the fact it was already pretty shocking for us to be filming in a you know, pretty high Episcopal church. And yes, St. John the Divine is a progressive place, but to have, you know, you see the gold crosses and white robes, and then suddenly these drums start. And what I really wanted to communicate is how people started, what? Where's that sound coming from? And how appropriate, thank you. And I did, I'm very glad you mentioned Ola Tunji because I, I wanted to mention him as well as another one who's passed on, who we don't have much uh, archival footage on, and the fact that he's in this is amazing. And his son, who was right next to him, who was also passed on, which is amazing. Yes, he was right next to him playing, oh. yeah, Olu. John, one of my students. Hi, I'm John. I was, I was actually, this movie for me was just kind of life-changing in a way. Um, I'm actually angry. <laughs> I'm like very angry that, that we're still in the same place after so many years. And I just wrote a friend of mine, I was like, I need to express my race and my race issues in my writing. But then I'm thinking like, what else can I do? Because it's like, we can't be going through the exact same thing that we went through still in the same place. It's just, it's, it's, I can't, the idea really angers me and I'm like, I'm a, film, I'm a film major, but I'm also doing writing, so I'm like, I, I literally just spoke to my friend. I was like, I need to discuss this more in a more creative way. And I'm just thinking, what else? What can we do? Because it's just seeing I'm, the history. I'm hoping that we can continue the conversation that Jimmy started. I'm hoping that you can find ways not to just speak with people of like mind, but to speak with people who are, maybe it's better to say, if we listen, I believe this, if we listen to other people, even those who think differently than we do, once, they're, once they've been heard, they're more likely to listen to us, and it's, it's um, the best way I know how to move forward. And by getting people to pay attention to somebody who said these things 50 years ago, and they still need to be said, if people stop and think, right at the moment they realize that there is that incredible parallel that is still continuing and the progress has yet to be made. They may be more open to the things that you want to say. So listening and talking. Ricardo, as the writer, you want to give John some <laughs> words of advice? By the way, I've been wanting to take a class with you for a while. So. <laughs> I, I just, I'm finding that it, it, Trying to institute something like race and ethnicity studies and make it visible at this university is, um, you know, a, an important challenge. And in these first classes that I've, I've um, created, um, I'm seeing a real need for students to have conversation, a, a need that has to move beyond the classroom. So all I, what I want to say now at this particular moment of, of starting to teach this coursework is that I want students to try and figure out how to find spaces with each other and outside of the, the, the confines of the classroom to, to continue these conversations and to, to um, try to get some work done, right? And having read your writing as your teacher, you need to continue writing. Your writing is amazing. <laughs> and, and, and it's a great way to express your, your rage, which you should well do. And writers, <laughs> writers are game changers. I believe that too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, John. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Jan Heller Levy. I want to thank you also for this incredible evening, that incredible film, for spreading the word, and for handing down. I teach at Hunter College, and I, I just want, I just want you to know that I observed a freshman composition course the other day as a senior faculty, I'm asked to observe junior faculty. And they were reading James, they were reading James Baldwin in freshman composition. So, and our job I think as teachers, readers, writers, filmmakers, is to pass down what we've been given. And I wanted to just bring a few more names into this room because I see them so much in line with Baldwin and that's, Maya Angelou, June Jordan, mm -hmm. Audre Lorde, Robert Hayden, Muriel Rukeyser, Nelson Mandela. <laughs> and I would just add France Fanon, which is someone that I, read, I, I saw so much when, I, when you were, when you, this film is 
when we just watched in class. We just watched Black Skin White Mask in class. So yeah, it definitely, thank you for that. Those are the people who definitely need to be around. Yes. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. I'm a second year student at Lang. My name is Aaliyah. I'm hearing talk about the need for spaces to talk about race and ethnicity um, experiences of students of color in the classroom and beyond. And I just wanted to plug in that um, I'm in the process with some other folks of coordinating the fourth students of color meetup. It's going to be, I think, Tuesday, December 2nd from 7.30 to 9.30 in the Social Justice Hub. So. Um, spaces are being created for that, and I just wanted to plug that space in. Please come. All are welcome. Well, students of color identifying folks are welcome, so. Thank yeah. you. So it's the social, ju say, it, say it again, it's the social justice. The social justice hub, which is the fifth floor of this building, from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m., December 2nd, a Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. And please support, because these spaces, you know, they, they need to be supported as well. Hi, my name is Taryn. Um, I was actually fortunate to read Baldwin. I went to Lang, graduated 2005. Um, I was introduced to The Fire Next Time and The Devil Finds Work as a cultural studies concentration. I don't think they call them concentrations anymore. So I was really fortunate to do that. Um, but my question in examining such a dynamic life, I'm sure it's difficult figuring out what you focus on. Are there some aspects that um, maybe you'd want to focus more on or didn't have the opportunity. Like, I love hearing about the relationship between Malcolm X and Baldwin. Like, I would watch a whole film on that. Um, are, is there something that, given the time, given unlimited hours, that you would like to spend more time on? Well, Jimmy certainly provided the option of unlimited hours. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't given that. I was as fascinated by his personal life as I was fascinated by his exploration of the craft of writing as his evolution politically and how he was seen as um, not radical enough and then gradually he was seen by the other half of the crowd as too radical and there, there, it was like skating along the surface of all these mountain peaks. Every single one of them, James Baldwin has something to offer. That's why his, his archive is worth plumbing and, and you know, perhaps that's a film to be made. It, in a way, we often thought of, of Jimmy and Malcolm and Martin as a triumvirate. And, and um, there was this north and the south and there was the city and, and more of the rural aspect and, and there was Jimmy and he, was, he, he didn't dislike either side. And I think one of the interesting things about Malcolm that I actually do wish that we'd gotten into the film even in the 87 minute version was that when Malcolm came back from Mecca and he said a phrase that has stuck with me as much as James Baldwin's, as long as you insist on thinking you're white, I'm gonna be forced to think I'm black. Well, Malcolm came back and said, white is a state of mind. I, I would like people to know that as well because I think that mattered a great deal to Jimmy and it's part of why he was able to say they're killing my friends. Hi, uh, my name is Gordon Thompson. A um, couple of things. Um, one is, I'm just wondering how many documentary films of black authors are actually out there. Um, and certainly I cannot remember being touched by seeing one as I was touched by this one uh, tonight for many reasons. Um, and one of them is that, you know, I was born um, in Harlem. I'm left-handed, I'm black. I'm gay. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm in the area of literature, so Baldwin has been a fixture in my mind for much of my conscious life. And I read the biographies, and there are things in this film that you're not going to get in the written biographies, the way he walks, uh, how he sits. Uh, it's just beautiful filling in for us the whole of Jimmy. So this is a very special thing for Jimmy lovers, as it were. You just can't get a lot of things in this film by reading it on the page. You might be, but no one seems to have taken the trouble to point out some of these small little intimacies. So for me, it's really great to see him like this, truly coming alive. Um, only one thing I want to say is an announcement, which is that I'm currently directing something called the Langston Hughes Festival. 
And the first award that the Lexington Hughes Festival gave at City College was to Jimmy Baldwin wow. on his homecoming trip back to the States in 78. Um, and we have a great speech that we're trying to um, record, trying to, um, what's the word, to um, transcribe. Um, and we would like, we'd like to see whether or not it stands up um, you know, on the page as well as it did when he gave the actual speech. So we're hoping to get that out at some point. And my last thing is, is that as director of the Langston Hughes Festival, we are on the 21st of November having Walter Mosley, Devil in the Blue Dress author, and we're giving him the, the latest award that we gave to Jimmy back oh, then. Wow. So free of charge, free refreshments, November 21st, <laughs> City College, Aaron Davis Hall, and that's what I'm handing out. Awesome, but also thank great. you. We have some flyers, okay, great. And Walter Mosley is important in James Baldwin's life. I wanted to say something about the humanity of James Baldwin. You mentioned we got to see him in ways that you can't necessarily get out of the literature. One of the moments that I treasure is the one and only time that I actually met with him. We worked with him from a distance, largely. He was always going all over the world, and we didn't get to see a lot of him. But one time he was coming through New York, and the film was going to happen. I remember this house was the plan. And so we met at a place where he probably took a certain amount of people whom he didn't really know, but met with them at the Ginger Man up near Lincoln's, Lincoln Center. <laughs> and I remember sitting there and believing he was going to show up, but it got later and later, and Jimmy wasn't there, and I just waited. And then all of a sudden, there was a bustle, and he <laughs> came, and I could see him standing in the doorway. And um, my first thought was that, oh my gosh, He's actually really tiny. <laughs> and then he spotted me, and I guess it wasn't hard to figure out who I was. <laughs> and um, his face just lit up, and it, it was a smile. And this is what I mean, Gordon. Uh, his smile filled the room, and he was larger than anyone I had ever met. Mm. And that is what I hope to communicate mm -hmm. with this film. There you go. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll take a couple more questions, because I, kn I know we're getting kind of late. Yes. This, uh, sorry. I'm sorry. The student had asked about um, Malcolm and Jimmy Baldwin. Uh, one of the things when they t say um, he wasn't radical enough, the reality is Malcolm has said that Jimmy Baldwin was supposed to speak at the March on Washington, and they disallowed his speaking because he would be too radical. So when you make that statement and you put it out there, it stands on its own merit, but the reality is when Malcolm first saw or heard Jimmy Baldwin, he was surprised to find out he was homosexual because he had read, really? But that did not stop him from respecting him and recognizing what a great fighter he was for black revolutionary thought. So for the uh, student that asked the question, Malcolm appreciated and recognized the warrior that James Baldwin was. Well said, yes. Thank you. Yes. Hi, this is actually a two-part question. My name is Tarsus, and I just want to, um, I'm very grateful that you individuals are here speaking to us tonight. Um, I want to first and foremost ask why, why James Baldwin and what piece of work was it that inspired you to in, want to investigate this individual? And also, why do you feel that people were so willing to believe that this individual was bitter instead of wanting to listen to the cause that he was so righteously fighting for. Thank you. Thank you. I'll answer the second question first because I think people were and are still threatened by the other, by differences that we have not dared to try and comprehend. And I think that's probably why Jimmy presented a problem. So far as my own encountering of him, I grew up in a situation that was relatively pri privileged. Um, perhaps in the white world I wasn't so privileged, but certainly compared to what was going on in, in society, I was. I first read James Baldwin in college, and I first read Notes of a Native Son, and then I went on to um, go tell it on the mountain and the fire next time. And I, the more I read, the more I was blown away. But I just kind of tucked that in my pocket as part of my, oh, glad to know there's someone out there saying that. That makes me think. But then when I was working with Albert and David Maisel's way back when, and somebody wrote a letter saying, 
why don't you guys make a film on James Baldwin? He's really interesting. And I jumped on that. And Albert, being the open-minded man that he is, said, OK, I can imagine that would be really a good thing to do. And it grew from there. And to answer your previous question, Gordon, I, I, there are not enough films done about black authors that we you know, have as a, a record, as a document of their work. Um, I know recently another good friend, colleague of ours, Sabrina Gordon, has done a film on Sonia Sanchez. Um, and mm -hmm. there has not been one, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, on Nikki Giovanni. There has not been one done on on Zora. Well, Zora, there's a there few is a films. film. There's a few films on Zora. Not not that is specifically only on her life, though. It's not a biography um, that I know of. Um, um, who else am I thinking? Maya Angelou. There will be. That, that, yeah, I but, believe yeah, that it's, it's be. they're in post production, and I believe it will be on American Masters. Yeah, this, I think there's this coming year, coming year by the man who did the film on Bill G. Jones. Oh right, that's right. So that should be something coming out. Yes. Ah, uh, Mira, Mira Banks. Banks made a film on Nikki Giovanni. I didn't know. I think so. Okay, but I don't think any of them have been on the scale of this as a feature documentary. Which, yeah. So we do need more of those. All of our filmmakers out here. Um, did we have one last question? You, are you a new school student? I want to get you guys in. No, I'm actually, I know I look about 15, but I'm an, actually an attorney. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. I don't mind. I like, it's good. It's a compliment. I'll take it as a compliment. Um, I'm actually, yeah, I'm a social justice advocate for LGBT immigrants. And I, I you started to answer my question, but I, so I'll hone into more narrow. I think narrow was better. Um, do you, do you think that he knew he needed to white, he needed to write uh, Giovanni's Room from a white perspective in order for anybody to, to read it. Attention. There's this sense that difference, stories about difference need to be written in a, va in a vacuum, that we can't exist as multiple. Um, I, I, I certainly get that sense in my own life. I know, you know I look white, but I'm actually a queer Latina. And it's, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you have a sense from that, from like beyond, from knowing him and from talking to him, if that was part of his decision in, in, in writing from a Can I pass the question to Ricardo? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm thinking there's somebody else in the audience that might be able to answer that too. I, I'll, Tracy I'll give Ann you a Williams, who teaches also in James Baldwin course. I think, <laughs> I think that he wanted to write something about more universal than black and queer. I think he wanted to reach a wider audience, but I'd really like to hear what Ricardo has to say. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that that's. It's hard to, to, to speculate on that. I do think like when we when we look at something like another country, like what he, the, the way that this narr the narrative of this film unfolds where he doesn't sort of go to the South until after another country is written. And yet the South mm -hmm. is so present as a fantasy space in that book. And he scripts the South through a gay white character that, that, that mm -hmm. sort of is affected by the death of, of Rufus, right? Um, and I wonder about that, that space of, of, of white fantasy and how Baldwin is using it both in Giovanni's room and in another country. And, and uh, so quickly, um, I also, uh, either through my organization or as an alum of the law school, not very far away, if you could please let, let anyone interested in trying to host uh, one of those conversations you were talking about, I would, I would absolutely love to be the contact person for that if, if oh. you were interested in either at the law school we have a website called jamesbaldwinproject.org, and um, you can contact us through the website, and we will be, starting in 2015, we will be doing screenings and, and conversations. <laughs> OK, great. Thank you. Well, I want to close the, the evening by thanking everyone for coming. Thank you so much to the Baldwin family for being here. We really made this special. Thank you. And Karen. And thank you to the new school. I haven't even said what I'm, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, my hands are so wet. I'm just so moved Douglas, by being here and you. how extraordinary the space is and being able to show Jimmy in his full splendor. It, it's absolutely a privilege. 
Thank you, Ricardo, for joining us for this evening. And do stay in touch. Look for uh, the next Creatively Speaking program at creativelyspeaking.tv. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>